Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. This is Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, in the United States. The Teton Range is iconic as a mountain range. The rocks here date back 2.7 billion years to ancient sediments that have been crushed by pressure and heat into hardened rock, with more young layers of sediment containing fossils on top of it. But the sediment was laid down underwater, in the ocean, in the sea. And then later, tectonic forces pushed those sediments up, buckling the crust of the earth. What I want to talk about in this series of lectures, beginning with this one, is what tectonics are all about. What is plate tectonics and how does it work? And we're going to start with the beginnings of the first understanding that that was even happening as a geologic process, around the turn of the century. German meteorologist Alfred Wegener had an idea about the continents. He had started to develop the idea that the continents may, in fact, be masses of rock that move across the surface of the Earth over time, that they drift or, or move laterally, horizontally, not up and down. At the time, the view of geologists was that the continents and, and rocks on Earth can, can rise, as mountains do, or it can subside, the earth can rift open, and continents can rise and fall, sink below the ocean, and rise up again. That's how they thought it worked. But no one believed among the scientific community that the continents could move laterally, could move horizontally across the surface of the world. This was a new idea. Wegener originally developed his idea around noticing on a world map how Africa and South America seemed to fit together really well. In fact, if you push them together like puzzle pieces, they would fit very nicely. These fossils are of a reptile called Mesosaurus, which lived during the early Permian period, about 300 million years ago. These fossils show this species in rocks that are found both in eastern South America and in western Africa. In fact, the, the sediments themselves as rocks, as geology, look very similar to each other. They were laid down in the same kind of depositional environment where water flows and sediments collect at the bottom. And they appeared to contain exactly the same kind of animal life. And there were plant fossils like Glossopteris, a kind of extinct seed fern that is no longer with us but was common at the time. And fossils of this plant are found across South America and Africa as well as Antarctica, Australia, and India, all continents of the southern hemisphere. And Wegener did not think these were coincidences. He interpreted this as evidence that Africa and South America had once been a single landmass, and the continents had somehow split and moved apart from each other. At the time, many would have explained this as that there were islands that aren't there now, a, a land bridge between the two continents, or a set of islands that, that uh, life could hop one to the other, and the islands are just gone now. Wagner's response was, no, what if the continents were both, at one time, one continent? Here you can see the distribution of fossils that convinced Wagner that something was going on here. If you look at where the fossils are found in sediments of those continents, you find things like Synognathus, Triassic land reptile, that fossils are found contiguously from South America over across the ocean into Africa for some reason. There was Mesosaurus, there are also the Glossopteris, and the proto-mammal of the uh, late Permian and early Triassic, Lystrosaurus, across Africa, India, and Antarctica. It becomes difficult to imagine a land bridge that could connect all those disparate continents, and just coincidentally, all those land bridges are gone now. To summarize, Wagner's evidence for continental drift, as he called it at the time, were that the coastlines of the southern continents do seem to fit together. If you put them on a the table as puzzle pieces, they fit fairly well. Fossils of Mesosaurus, Glossopteris, and other species show that they seem to have lived in widely distributed, widely different parts of the world today, but if you put those continents together, their fossil occurrences match up really nicely. And in fact, the sedimentary rocks themselves, just the sequence of rocks, the kinds of sedimentary rocks, limestone giving way to siltstone, giving way to conglomerate, and so forth, the specific types don't matter right now, but the point is 
those stacked layers of sediment matched up across the Atlantic Ocean. And this became powerful evidence that, in fact, something had gone on. Adding to this was glacial evidence. Here we see a map that is adapted from the one Wegener put together. He fit the continents back together into one big mass, which is known today as Pangaea. And if you fit them together like this, not only do the fossil ranges, as I've said, match up, but also deposits of glacial sediment, evidence of glaciation. The glacial evidence doesn't make any sense distributed across all these different continents. But if you put the continents together, all those different parts of the puzzle latch together perfectly. The problem was no mechanism or process could be imagined at the time as to how the continents are going to move across the surface of the Earth. Wegener proposed that the continents were plowing through the ocean crust like a ship plowing through the ocean waves. But that doesn't work. The ocean crust is denser than the continental crust and it just wouldn't function that way. So for a time, Wegener's ideas, though intriguing, were largely rejected by the scientific community. And at the time, probably rightly so, because there was no mechanism by which this could work. It sounded good, the evidence was compelling for something, but this specific interpretation of the evidence was generally rejected. Ultimately, proof for plate tectonics came from an unlikely source, specifically the Earth's magnetic field and fossil magnetization of rocks. Earth's magnetic field is a geodynamo, meaning it's produced constantly in the outer core of the Earth. The liquid iron outer core, moving against the solid inner iron core, sets up basically an electromagnet, and the magnetic field of the Earth is powered that way. Earth's magnetic field sometimes breaks down and reasserts itself in the opposite direction. It reverses polarity. These magnetic reversals are common in Earth's history. On the right, you can see a small chart showing just in the last few million years how many times the magnetic field is reversed. The white bar represents a normal period because we're living in it, we call it normal. And black represents a reverse time. There's not a lot of rhyme or reason to when these happen. They are kind of random. What happens when a reversal occurs is that if there are any magnetic rocks that form during that time frame, they will tend to imprint with the Earth's magnetic field. So for example, if you have lava flows like we see here stacked up in Washington State, these are Columbia River basalt flows, old lava flows on top of each other. Now if you were to go in there and take a sample of each different lava flow, one stacked up onto the other, you would, if you did it carefully, would be able to go into the lab and measure the magnetic fields of little magnetite grains. Magnetite is an iron oxide mineral. It's magnetic, lodestone, it's called. And it forms as lava cools along with the other minerals in the, in the basalt. But magnetite is magnetic, so as it crystallizes out of liquid, it will imprint with the Earth's magnetic field. Go in later, measure that field, and it doesn't matter what changes in the Earth's magnetic field after that point, the magnetite grains are fixed. You can see the record of the reversals of Earth's magnetic field by looking at rocks. And so you can detect and measure the record of Earth's magnetic field reversals by measuring magnetite grains in lava. Now, after Wegener's time, other scientists stayed on the chase for plate tectonics and were trying to figure out a plausible mechanism. After World War II, when we started going into the Cold War with the Soviet Union, it became very important to chart the ocean floor because of submarine warfare. Also, laying of communications cables, telephone cables, uh, across the ocean floor required that we map the ocean floor to do that. And when that happened, when the mapping occurred, new mountain ranges were discovered. The mid-ocean ridges are chains of mountains, volcanic mountains, that run along the ocean floor. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the East Pacific Rise, these are mountain ranges that are quite tall and quite impressive, but until the age of deep sea exploration, we had no idea they were there. Scientists were intrigued as to what these things were. Why were there stitches like baseball stitches running across the world on the ocean floor? And began taking samples, discovering that these are seafloor basaltic volcanoes. A shocking discovery came out of analysis of magnetite from seafloor basalt. The record of magnetization and reversals was identical, a mirror image, on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and marching away from the ridge axis, the basalts become progressively older on both sides of the rift. And in fact, they are absolute mirror images of each other. But this was the discovery that really clinched the deal of what's going on is seafloor spreading. 
These are spreading centers where the crust is forming in the middle, new crust, and it marches away as new crust is forming at the original axis. Heat flow produces a magma chamber, a partial melt in the lower crust, and that feeds these volcanoes. And it feeds the production of new ocean crust as the old ocean crust marches away on both sides. Age dating of the basalt reveals basically what the magnetic reversals reveal, that the youngest basalt is right along the ridge axis. On this map here, you can see color-coded in red the positions of the mid-ocean ridges of our planet. And that's where they track because that's the youngest material. That's where the material is the youngest it's being formed today. As you move away from the mid-ocean ridge on either side, the rocks become progressively older. And so this is where ocean crust forms at a divergent spreading center. 